Welcome to the Troy Kearns Podcast, where we talk all things real estate, business, and entrepreneurship. Today, I have a very, very special guy in my studio today. Two flights to get here from Naples, Florida, and he brought his son, and we're going to be hanging out all day, and he's a good friend of mine. His name's John Schlombush, and John is actually more than just a good friend. He's been my business partner for 15 years now. We've bought hundreds of homes together. We've flipped hundreds of homes We've actually sold thousands of homes together, and I brought John on because little do all you guys know is John and I are about ready to launch our real estate coaching program, and so I wanted to really take a deep dive and get to know who John is, where he's from, what he's been up to, how many properties he's sold. John, welcome to the show. All right, so how many houses, for people who don't know who you are, and you don't have a huge social media presence, like I'm just rolling out John here for the first time. And really the reason I'm rolling out him is like in terms of a mentor in my real estate professional career, in terms of selling real estate, you've been that like in REO, we worked that together and we could talk, go backwards on that. But how many houses have you personally sold? Uh, just over 5,000, just over 5,000 folks. Yeah. <laughs> it's lots of listing presentations there. So lots of, awkward presentations in people's oh absolutely i I learned it myself trial and error you know yeah and you and you're like a fiend for money like like we got we had that in common and 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 one of the things that like so this is how it went down and 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 john knows this story well but literally i couldn't sell him advertising and i but i knew he was an excellent realtor like i knew like hanging out with this guy that he just stuck to his ways he grinded out the phones and so I had actually reached out to my mentor who was Aaron Renfro at the time when this REO opportunity opened up and he kind of put me to the sidelines. And then I talked to you and you're like, I'm in yeah. like, I'm, I'm in. And like, literally you booked a plane ticket that day. Mm-hmm. We went down to Dallas, Texas yeah. for the DS news REO convention. And here's the funniest part. Do you know what John was doing the whole time we were there? Calling expired. <laughs> I couldn't let it down. Yeah, it's just persistence is the key with those, you know. And after it, uh, it just becomes a party after a while. Yeah, your habit was so ingrained that literally you were walking around with a bunch of papers. At, we're at this conference to go and try to meet REO clients. And you're literally at this conference nonstop dialing with a big sheet of papers you're carrying around. Yes. I just knew that if I wasn't calling them, somebody else would and somebody else was going to get that business and it wasn't going to be me. How'd you take rejection? I just moved on to the next one, really. So it did not bother me at all. One of your fam- famous quotes that you've told me a long time ago is you said, even ordinary salespeople can get extraordinary results simply by hitting the numbers. Absolutely. Couldn't be more true. So if you're talking to people and you know, one of the things that we're going to be rolling out is a coaching program, what are some nuggets of information that you can drop on our audience in terms of what it takes to be a successful realtor that sold 5,000 houses? That doesn't just fall in your lap. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, maybe natural ability people focus on, it's all that's overrated. Persistency is the key. You have to be persistent, you know, continually going after it consistently. Right. So you're saying that like you can't take a week off and then decide to do something. And and not if you want to hit the high numbers and be as good as you can be. Right. And like you started, where did you start your real estate career? Can you take us back there? Uh, John L. Scott, real estate in Tacoma. We were called Tacoma, but we're really in Lakewood. So, and Lakewood's a little offshoot of Tacoma? Yes, a little south. And I've seen a lot of those plaques in your office when you were with John L. Scott. What did they say on them? Uh, there's top 1% awards, you know, salesperson of the year awards. We had the top producing, um, office in Pierce County at the time. And I hit it month after month after month. So, so you were doing that. So you're the number one sales guy in, in, at the John L. Scott office. And for those of you guys who don't know Washington or Seattle, Washington, John L. Scott is the premier brand. Would you still agree with that? Yeah, it's, it's changed since, but back in the day, yes, it was. Yeah. For like a lot of years, like for like, for like 20 or 30 years, it was a sign that you saw everywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you were their top dog in Tacoma. John L. Scott and Windermere. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And that's crazy because Windermere is a big brand as well. And they're both out of Seattle, Washington, just like Boeing and Microsoft and all these other companies. Yeah. Now they're regional to the West coast. I think both of them, both of them are regional to the West coast. I believe so. Yes. So eventually you went out on your own. What, what, what made you go out on your own? 
Well, a number of things. I just wanted more control. I didn't like having you know people breathing down my neck all the time and this and that. I wanted more control of everything. So even though you're hitting all these numbers, they're still breathing down your neck? Uh, no, not when you have your own office. But when you're working with John L. Scott. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. You're yeah, still yeah. at the top 1%. They're, they're breathing down your neck? Yeah, and a lot of it is just because of you know the other agents and them saying things and this and that. So there's a lot of politics in real estate? There can be, sure. Right. <laughs> so now you have your own office. How many agents currently work with you? Uh, I think we have 75 or so right now. 75, and you're in downtown Tacoma. And yeah, Old Town Tacoma Old by town. the waterfront. Beautiful area. Beautiful area. And so let's talk about how the REO journey kind of changed your real estate business. And, and I'm going to take a st- if you're okay with saying this, when I first met John, um, he was diehard, like, very much, like he said, regimented, doing things, I would say old school, the way the way of old school. Like he didn't have a, you didn't even believe in cell phones at that point in time. Well, they were just kind of, I'm old, so they were just kind of coming along at that point. They weren't kind of coming along. They had been along for about. <laughs> <laughs> I had one. I just didn't store numbers in it. Yeah, so he, he had everything memorized. Yeah. So it was a, it was a phone. And this is not to embarrass him or anything, like that, but literally, like, we're going into a very technological aspect of real estate, which was REO where everything's assigned by a computer. And when John and I got, and he's like super amped, he's like, yeah, I'm ready to do whatever. I put him through a couple tests too. I don't remember if you remember the Ivan Choi test. Um, you have to remind me. Southern California. We found, uh, Oh, we knocked on the door. Yes. After he told us not to come down. (laughs) Yeah. So we had like a countrywide financial. This guy is like the number one guy. He's in all the REO events. Everybody wants to get to know him. I'm like, John, we're going down to Irvine, California, and we're going to walk into his office and you're going to walk back there. And this is like literally a secure, like, like they don't want you back there. It's like offices. You shouldn't be in the hallway. This guy's already told me not to call him anymore, by the way. (laughs) (laughs) So does that affect you? So Troy and I ventured in and knocked on his door. Oh, actually, I, didn't, I think I just sent you back. Oh, maybe it was just me, yeah. Yeah, I was like, I was kind of doing the whole thing. Do you got what it takes? Do you, are, you willing to, are you willing to go the distance? And you definitely have what it takes. So in that REO world, you became like the top agent in the entire Washington area. Yeah, maybe a, a couple years there, yes. And yeah, most closings, I think, was, was it 587 or something. In 2011, I believe. Right. I had my most closings in 2011 as well. Yeah. 643. Just a little bit more than you. (laughs) Just a a hair more. But I guarantee your, your, your earnings were higher because you were selling a little bit more expensive, a little bit more expensive expensive properties. And let's just, let's talk about that a little bit. Like those houses, you remember what they were selling for back in the day? Like this is 2011. We're talking about back in the day. So just 11 short years ago. The market was decimated. It, they hit lows of maybe 30 to 40,000, you know, and a couple of years before that, they were 150, 200,000. And where are they at now? And now they're up four or 500,000, same ones. So we, we recently sold a, like, what, four or five of our properties? Yes, we did 1031s and moved them to KC, where we're at now. Right, and we got like a, what, five to one on those? Yes, five to one consistently and a couple of six to ones. <laughs> <laughs> we're talking about that. We mean like we bought one house, 1031 did for five houses or six houses. Just trading cash flow. Just trading cash flow. We had, we were, so we had, we had an amazing asset. We bought like what, 10 assets together in Tacoma. Yeah. 12, but yeah. Okay. 12 total. He knows the numbers better than me on that. So every property, I think the top we paid for a property was like a hundred thousand and we paid several that were 40 or $50,000 mm. and nobody was buying them back there. Everybody was scared. Yeah. They thought it was going to go lower. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And so we, we really haven't bought a property in Tacoma, I think since 2016 or 17. Right. But yeah. the last one we paid was like, so that's only five or six years ago away. The most expensive one we paid was in 2016 or 17 for 96. And what do you think that property's worth today? Oh, it's close to 500,000. Close to 500,000. Yeah. We should be selling that one pretty yeah. soon. Because when you look at it that I shouldn't have way, told you. Yeah. Well, when you look at things that way, and John is, um, you come from a real estate background a little bit. Your dad's, t- let's talk about your family and your upbringing. Yes. My dad is uh, well into real estate. He started as a, um, in construction, had a big concrete company, Tacoma Concrete. Did the Tacoma Dome and, you know, various school projects and malls around the whoa, city. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Let's go back up. He did the Tacoma Dome. Yes, sir. Is that a small job? That's a huge job. <laughs> Is, so he did the whole damn... All the flat work of the Tacoma Dome and the ramps and everything. 
Wow. He did all that. Yes. That was, how did he get a contract like that? He's the only guy in town that had the pump trucks back then. Okay. Pump trucks were a new thing and he had a fleet of them. So he could handle anything really. Right. And, and your dad has an amazing work ethic. You're always bragging about that to me. And you're like, yeah, my, both my mom and dad, incredible work ethics. Is that where you think your work ethic? Yeah, maybe from? a little bit. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it, it's kind of funny. So you, you saw your dad working all the time. He was like, up what time did he get up in the morning i never saw my dad once before school and i know what that's saying and it's not exaggerating i never saw my dad once before school so my dad hit the office at five in the morning you know he was there by five every single day and what time did he get home he got home at you know we ate dinner at six every night so six. he was home by then yeah and what's he up to these days he's 88 he's 88 he's golfing he's working in the yard he's tinkering around his apartments you know staying active yeah. As is my mom. And so the other thing about that with your dad and your mom is he built his own apartment building. Yes. Yes. And that's really difficult to do where you're building a ton of units. You're not getting any money coming in. And uh, yeah, he was able to do that and has a number of complexes now. And after he did that, he pretty much retired. Yes. He retired at 49. And a half, I think you told me. Something like that. <laughs> And so then w once you did that, he moved down to Tacoma or not moved from Tacoma to Arizona, Sun City, West Arizona. How long was he down there? He was down there 20 years going back and forth. And then he just came recently, came back. Yeah. Up. Once our son Marcus was born uh, nine years ago, they moved back up here full time or back to Tacoma full time. Right. So you've got now you've got three amazing children. You uh, you're in you're in Naples, Florida. What brought you down to Naples? Well, I had a great friend. His name is Troy Kearns, <laughs> whose in-laws live in Naples. And we were, we were venturing around Florida, looked at a number of spots. And once we hit Naples, it just felt like home. Really, it's paradise, heaven on earth there. So let's go into that a little bit. Like, how much would you, how much would you say that your environment, um, not only like your upbringing uh, in terms of affects your work ethic, but your environment where you live affects your ability to think differently like do you feel happier being in naples florida yeah i mean it's just every day the sun shining you know and it's, uh, it's a whole another mindset i mean in tacoma it rains quite a bit if people are familiar with it so oh yeah everybody everybody knows seattle's doom and gloom right yeah yeah there's lots of suicides there i hear <laughs> so that's one thing it's got going for it it's like the number one place to kill yourself yeah, I mean, Tacoma is a, a wonderful place. There's natural beauty. You know, I think we were talking with one of your guys here the, about the Pacific Northwest. And, you know, so there's a, a lot to offer there. You get the four seasons and everything. But it's, uh, it's a whole world of difference from Florida, really. I don't know about the four seasons. I'm a lifelong uh, Puget Sound resident. I think you get like two seasons. Rain, rain, less rain. Warmer some, rain, colder <laughs> rain. Some <laughs> some rain and then some sun so it's like different forms of rain and then some forms of sun yes Is that accurate? that's probably pretty close yeah you would know yeah but okay but recently after COVID, things got crazy in seattle can you talk to pe people who know about tacoma and seattle are pretty much the same thing in terms of when we're talking about them right now what changed from a like a political standpoint not to get into politics but like from like your personal and your private rights that made you want to leave to come. There was just lots of restrictions, um, which, you know, I could handle, but really it was when they started putting them on the kids is when we got, you know, sick of it and wanted to move elsewhere. <laughs> right. So you felt like you didn't have a, a choice in what your kids were doing. Yeah. I mean, they had them eating lunch outside, you know, and it gets pretty cold there in the winter time and rainy you know and um so you know, mass us. mass on the play fields and on the tennis courts and you know different things like that so as a father you were like that's that's not happening yeah i didn't really want to put my kids through that really so they were having them eat lunch outside in the rain yeah with yeah. a face mask on in between bites yeah <laughs> <laughs> i wasn't there but so i've heard yeah so that's crazy so enough got enough and you had been talking about moving you 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 haven't lived in washington your whole life have you lived anywhere else i lived in la briefly um going back and forth trying to sell real estate in two different places for a while there back in like oh five oh four um and then just other than that washington state university wsu right. which is in pullman the other side of the state right on so 
as somebody who's gr- grown up in Tacoma, was raising their kids in Tacoma, and just moved across the country, the complete opposite direction of Washington, I literally think it's the furthest place you could get from. Yeah, they're both uh, on both corners of the spectrum there. So are you having any regrets about this? Are you, is there anything that you miss? Anything that you, any advice to anybody who's thinking about maybe moving or getting No, out? I mean, the technology makes it easier, you know, because I can work both places. Um, fairly easy. I was, most of my business in Tacoma was behind the desk anyway. And I figured I could do that anyway. Cause I don't really go out and meet with buyers and sellers as much as I used to, right. um, more so sending the agents out. So could right. do that pretty much anywhere. And you have a really good system. I was listening to you on the phone earlier for like one of the things that, you know, we're obviously going to teach people how to do it, but you have a team of callers that has for, I think for the last five or six years, yeah, we've had a good inside sales group for at least that, if not longer. And, uh, you know, about four of them consistently. And they'll set appointments for the sales team, which I'll assign to the individual brokers. You found that that's just easier than actually trying to train the, the agents just don't want to set the appointment. The agents don't, you know, some of them will, some of them don't. But everybody likes a, an appointment here and there given to them. Everybody likes a spoon feed deal. Yeah, and yeah, it, right. And you don't have to worry about it. So that's an attractive reason to come work for you. And if, if somebody wants to come work for you and they're listening to this podcast, how would they get a hold of you, John? Um, I could give them my cell number. You want me to give you Let's my cell do number? It. It's 253 yeah. 3815608. So if you you're if you're in Washington state and you're looking for a great place where they're going to feed spoon feed you leads, definitely give John a call. He's probably one of the most honest guys I know. I think that's one of your better qualities is that you're honest, you're transparent. Um, I also want to tell you that like when we got into REO business, that really changed our lives. We were, we were working for the banks changed completely how you did real estate, right? Absolutely. So, and then REO died and like I was back to doing regular real estate and the person I called to figure out how to do regular real estate was John. Like, I don't know how to do this. Like I had really only sold five homes before I became this REO superstar which taught me a ton about transactional experience, how banks negotiate, all of that stuff. But then we're back to the basics yes. and I didn't know the basics and you knew the basics very well. And I called you and I want to go through those, what those basics are at like, number one, what, how do you think agents become successful? Well, a lot of it is just coming up with a game plan and being consistent with it. Consistency is the key, you know, being persistent. On average, how many days or how many hours per day would you make phone calls to get exp- to unexpired listings? I would tell pe- people would ask me like, when's the best time to call or how often do you call and all that. Um, there was years and years that would go by where my answer was, it's, it's easier for me to tell you when I'm not calling. <laughs> I'm not calling when I'm in the shower. I'm not calling when I'm going to the bathroom typically. Uh, maybe when I'm eating dinner, the calls aren't maybe. consistent. <laughs> maybe. Other than that, I, that's what I did. I was calling, you know. I had a couple phones going at once. On the appointments, I was calling to and from. So you got in your car, you're calling. I was calling, yes. Yes. And so, and that's helped you sell over 5,000 homes. Absolutely, yes. And, and it's not like you're doing, and you could look at it, you could be digging a ditch. It's different than an REO account where you need just one or two or many, hopefully, um, good REO clients, and then you steadily get more business after you sell each one. Um, It's a one-and-done scenario. So aside from the referrals, it's constantly getting more and more business. Right. And that's one thing that you taught me a lot, especially with the REO clients, in terms of how to treat your client. John is, like, one of the best. Like, he follows the rules. He does exactly what the client wants. And... That's something that communication is really the key with that in the customer service. Right. The main reason a home seller is dissatisfied with their agent's performance is they never hear from them typically. Right. You know, so that's the key is you want to get a good team um, with you that commu- helps you communicate well with everybody um, just to make sure that, uh, you know, you're providing that top notch service. That's totally true. Like, because I'm frustrated right now with an agent and the biggest thing is. I don't feel like he's doing anything or communicating about anything. It typically will boil down to communication is why the home sellers will switch to a new agent. Right. So when you're going on that, when you're calling somebody an expired listing, right, which is for those of you guys who don't know, what's an expired listing, John? An expired listing is say you're selling your house and uh, you agree to list it with me and we'll list it for a period of time, typically 90 to 120 days. At the end of that term, if it doesn't sell, then the seller is able to 
you know, just let it expire. The agent will typically try to renew it. And if the seller will not renew it, then it'll expire. At that point, it's open game for any broker in that particular MLS to go after them. Right. And when you say go after them, what are you going after? To earn their business, to prove that you're the person to sell their property. Typically, their goal is to sell it fast and for the most money. So you want to ask the qualifying questions and then prove you're the person to do that. So what sort of qualifying questions would you ask me if I was a potential prospect that you were cold calling? First and foremost, the most important thing is, do you want to sell still? <laughs> you know, because a lot of I've heard a lot of expired scripts where they'll go on and on about this and that. And then the reality is maybe in a couple of minutes, the seller will say, hey, that sounds great, but I don't want to sell anymore. <laughs> right. So that's the first question. Are you still looking to get the house sold? Are you still looking to get the house sold? What's the second question? The second question is, um, depending on how they answer that, you can go a number of ways. Um, if they don't really give you too much g good information, you would ask a question such as, other than the house not selling, what do you wish you would have got from your agent that you didn't get before? Right. And they'll tell you what's very important to them, and that's what you talk about. Right. So you're, this is great information, guys, who are listening right now. So you're, you're getting the answer, and then you're using that answer to get the business. Yes. And then from that answer, you'll, they'll give you something that you can close for the appointment, typically. What would be something that you could close for the appointment? Um, uh, usually, it's the, a lot of times it's the price. You know, so they'll, feel, they'll say, oh, I feel it was worth it. He was trying to get me to come down. And that's an opportunity to close for the appointment. Um, so what would you say in that situation? I would say, okay, great. When's the best time to pop by and take a look at it? Right. This or that? This or that, yes. So alternative close always. And, and um, people who are scared of the phones, like a lot of people these days, oh, I don't want to get on the phones. Mm -hmm. What would you say to them? There's going to be a limit to the amount of money you're going to be able to make in the, in the real estate business if you're fearful of the phones. There just really is. Right. It's, it's pretty much, if you look at an office, can you tell who's going to be successful if you go and look at that office? It's, you know, you don't, you really don't know what's burning um, somebody's belly, so to speak, right. you know, because that's really the most important um, aspect of any successful person is, or non-successful person is how bad do you want it? That's such a great point. And uh, we can take a little sidestep here. And we had, a, I had a friend of mine who is no longer a friend of mine. And one of the things that you told me, you, t you saw me trying to help this person be successful. And I was kind of venting with you. And you said, it's all down to how bad they really want it. It doesn't sound like he really wants it that bad. And, and that stuck with me so much. It's like, I can want it as bad as I want it for this person. Yeah. But if they don't want it, Yes. It doesn't matter. Yes. I mean, just when, you know, interviewing new brokers for the team, if you can sense somebody would rather be dead than be, not be super successful, that's the person that's going to do the best. Wow. So it just, you can, you, so the questions that you're asking people are like, you know, how many calls are you willing to make a day? How many things are you willing to do? And, and almost disqualify people. Well, just how successful do you want to be? And what are you looking, what would you be willing to put into that to make right. that happen? Right. So, I think one of the best things that we really need to get to is the awkward moments of the listing presentation. You've told me, and, and <laughs> you've got a big old grin right now because you know where I'm going with this. So one of the things that John has told me, and I'm going to kind of tee this up for you a little bit, is like that he would refuse to leave a listing appointment with without the listing agreement signed. Like the mics, and, and that's where really that, that teetered on me because I would call him after I lost a listing appointment, and he's like, well, did you leave without getting the listing sign? And, I'm, and he's like, I'm like, yeah. He's like, well, why? And I'm like, well, it worked this way this time. And I figured it would work that way this next time. Like I did it this way. I followed up with him and I got it this time. And he's like, do you think your percentages are always going to play that way? Or, and so talk about like the actual psychology behind when you have someone with a listing agreement who wants you to leave and doesn't want to sign. And what do you do? It's really just the mindset, knowing that what you have to offer those sellers is really their best route to take to achieving their goals. And if you firmly believe that, then you will not, as you mentioned, leave <laughs> before they you know, move forward with that. And it's important to ask a closing question more than once. You know, a lot of good sales trainers will say three to five times minimum. Right. So, and the best closing question that I've ever come up with, and I, I came up with this I think I came up with this one on my own, actually, <laughs> is did you have any other questions before we go through the listing paperwork? And that's a wonderful close because whether they say yes or no, you're in the ballgame. And it's actually a good thing if they say no. 
Because so then you're just writing away. So let's just play that forward. So, no, I'm not. Did you have any other questions before we go through the listing paperwork? Uh, yes, I do. Okay, great. What are they? <laughs> um, how long is this going to take? <laughs> so so if, they, if, if you got the guy who's hard to close, one of the things that you told me is that you would go through... For, for those of you guys who don't know what a Form 17 is, that's a Washington form for basically a, a, a disclosure agreement. You yes. would say that if you couldn't get them, what would you I, have? I would, a lot of times, I would, if, you know, maybe the, the conversation was not going anywhere and we didn't have much else to talk about, I would start filling out the Form 17, yes. And what is, so what is a Form 17? It's a seller disclosure. It's required when anybody sells a house that they have to answer this questionnaire. And then the buyers make their offer subject to their review and approval of that. So why would you start just filling out a uh, seller's property disclosure at, with them on the spot? Because we, you'd want to get all the information that you can necessary to help them the best. You don't want to forget anything, particularly anything that's going to cost them time or money. What if they don't want to sell with you, but you just keep going on the Form 17? What was the, psycho the psychological... The, the psychological reason is you're getting people moving forward with paperwork. Right. You you're, know. you're getting them time committed. Yes. And then you're asking a lot of yes questions, like do you still yes, have a water the, heater? The, the yes questions are throughout the whole presentation because the more little yeses you get, the easier the big one at the end is. Right. And there's, they're saying yes the whole time. Right. If you're asking like, and you, you guys still own this house together, right? Yes. And you guys, you, you you guys prefer, want the most money as possible, correct? Yeah, yeah right. Yes. And, uh, you know, s such as um, your terms would be cash, conventional, FHA, and VA, all of which will bring you cash at closing, which is, I imagine, what you'd prefer, correct? Yes. Yes. <laughs> that would be one there. Yes. So can you tell me about, like, some of the most awkward uh, listing presentations? I'm sure you remember those. Uh I just knew that the silence was in my favor, my favor meaning I'm trying to get the listing, you know, because I think that my game plan is the best for the people. So once you ask the question, whether, you know, however you're going to ask for the listing, um, the most important thing after is to not say another word. And the longer the silence, the better. You right. know, as you mentioned, awkward. You know, I didn't look at it that way because <laughs> I knew that the longer the silence, the better for me. So I wasn't awkward for me. So what would, what would, be, what would be like the people's like mannerisms? Would they change? Would they get uncomfortable? Would they get fidgety? When, when that, that awkward silence if, if that happened, then you knew you're working your way towards the goal of them signing, yes. So, like, if you see me and I'm like, I'm not saying anything, I'm trying not to say anything, then eventually I say something. What's the sign that I'm going to sign? They, well, they say the longer the silence, the better, and, and the first person that talks either wins or loses, depending on how you look at it. Right. You know, so the, the best sign that you're going to sign is that you haven't spoke, and neither have I for... You know, maybe a minute or two. Which feels like a freaking eternity. <laughs> right. Feels like a freaking eternity, dude. Yes. And you're just sitting there with your pen, kind of looking down and looking up. And, you know, and if they, if they, you know, depending on their gestures from there, you could either give them the pen or just keep the pen and keep looking at them. So you're literally staring them down with a big smile and your pen in your hand. If, if, if the opportunity arose for that, yes, that, that's what I would be doing. Right. And a lot of times you're just pointing and saying, sign here sign here and people are just kind of following because you're the expert and you already know that yes and so when you're coming into these sellers who aren't the experts you know that you are mm -hmm. so you're confident that you're going to close it that you're going to close them and the other obje objection that you can overcome by saying that well you're a little pushy well do you want somebody who's a lay down or someone who's actually going to close the deal mm -hmm. and if there was something that they were objecting to i'd want to know about it because i knew i could overcome anything that they said so if they said something like, well, gosh, we know that we, the time frame for silence may be a long time. And at the end, they may say something like, well, we did notice that you had a 120 day listing agreement. We just felt like we were locked in and trapped, you know, the last time. So we don't, we did not feel comfortable with that at all. Okay, great. Would you feel um, comfortable moving forward if we were to put a 30 day cancellation guarantee? Would you be okay with me moving forward and selling your property for top dollar if we were to do that? And a lot of times they just say yes, and then it's an easy one, and you just write seller may cancel after 30 days and not pay anything. Right. So pretty simple, just overcoming the objection, putting the objection in writing, having them initial, take the step forward. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Um, so I, I think I remember Dave, your, uh, your uh, sales agent, mentioning one time you like, he had to crawl out of a window 
Do you remember? That? <laughs> <laughs> Can we talk about that story? I don't even know it. So can you? Did he have to crawl out of a window? Or you crawl no, out of a window or something? No, maybe he felt like he had to crawl out of a window, perhaps. <laughs> Uh, oh, when, when you uh, were driving your car. Your, your oh, yes. Uh, yeah, there's lots of stories with my cars over the years because I went from hiding the, the car because it was, you know, not nice <laughs> to also later hiding the car because in some cases it was worth maybe a little bit more than the house I was trying to sell. <laughs> so in both cases, you're hiding down the block. And the first case, cr climbing out the car windows because my car door wouldn't open. It was when I that was in the earlier years? Much, yeah, that was in the earlier years. So I wanted to park down a couple blocks so they didn't see me crawl out my car window. <laughs> <laughs> and then you mentioned, I remember saying this earlier on, like one of the things, you, you bought your first Porsche when you first really became successful. Can you talk about that and how that felt? Yeah, it was... Uh, uh, <laughs> not something maybe that I'd recommend doing. It was probably 25 years ago now. Yeah. But um, I was a little more cocky at the time, I think. Right. And I <laughs> young gun, whippersnapper, just kicking, yeah, and killing the game. They just changed the body style in 1999, so I thought I had to have it. And I went down there, and there was something wrong with my financing or something. And they said that I couldn't um, take the car that day. Because of finance. And my ego wouldn't have that. So Your goes, ego said, no way, I'm taking the car this day. Yeah. So what'd you do? Uh, so I brought out the checkbook and wrote the check. Back when you had checkbooks? Back when I had checkbooks, yeah. So you wrote a check, and how much did you write that check for? Uh, do I have to say? Yeah, everybody loves it the number. like $93,000 or something crazy. And that was like, that probably was like, to, today's money, three hundred. dollars Maybe, yeah. So you just wrote a check, you said, I'm, I'm taking the car today. The car's mine. <laughs> And so that just goes, so I wanted to keep going a little bit. So, so John, obviously, is, the reason that we're having this podcast today, and I'm, I'm super appreciative of you flying up here on such short notice and be willing to do that. Um, we've really developed a great relationship. Our kids play together. Like, their best friends live in Naples now, which is super cool. We've had a, a, a great relationship through sports and football. I mean, you and I have been to how many football games together? A lot. Lots. Over, over 20, probably. Over 20. Um, you know, we're building our house next doors to each other. Like, really, this is really cool. Like, when biz and, and we didn't know each other 16 years ago, really. Right. And so, like, everybody was like, oh, man, I got to have these lifetime friendships. A lot of times, like, your friendships grow as you grow, right? Like, and your friendships end as either that friendship doesn't grow or that person doesn't grow. And we've continued to grow and continue to embrace uh, education and knowledge and all that stuff. And that's why I felt like, man, I was like, one of the things I don't even talk about is the fact that I sold 3,000 homes. I don't even bring that up. I'm just a real estate investor. I don't even talk about my past career as a successful real estate agent. But then as we add us together, we've sold 8,000 homes. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at this and I'm like, John, and I, and I want John to be back involved because we were involved together heavily for how many years? In the REO? Yes. Uh, probably seven, eight years. I was flying up there pretty much twice a month. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yes. I mean, he was like, get up here, we got stuff to do, get up here, yeah. get up here, get up here. And I was coming up there all the time, spending a lot of time with your family, really got to know yes. them, your wife, Crystal, your kid, Marcus, your kid, Violet, your kid, yes. Sonny, every, any, every one of your kids. And John's a family man. He really likes having his family around him. But one of the things you started after REO was tennis. Yes. Probably for like some stress relief after <laughs> dealing with all these freaking banks. Because they were brutal, right? Yes. So, and I, I want to break down sports and athleticism and business and how they translate because now you're quite the tennis player. Well, I, I put the time in, we'll put it that way. So let's talk about that. What does that t tennis look like for you? Um, it just made it part of my daily regime, really. I get up first thing I do normal, on most days, let's play tennis, you know. Yeah. Um, good stress reliever. And when I first met you, you were not a tennis professional. In fact, <laughs> in fact, you're the best you've ever looked right now that I've oh. seen. You, that I've seen you. I'm not trying to hit on you right now, but uh, what are you doing after this podcast? <laughs> <laughs> but like, like literally, you're you're in the best shape I've ever seen you, and you look the happiest. You're playing the best tennis. When we first started working together, John's wife at the time was like, "John, do you want cookies for breakfast?" <laughs> like literally, I don't know if you remember that. Brownies, I think it was. It was brownies. You're right. <laughs> so, my bad. <laughs> And you were, you were like, I think 250 mm -hmm. and we were playing, we, I think you first had this fascination with tennis when we were out at, uh, at Crescent Bard. 
Yeah, you just started then. I, I played a little throughout my life, but just started kicking it in right then, yeah. And tennis has like changed your body, changed your mindset, changed everything, and, you, and you've been playing it pretty heavily for like the last seven years, right? Yeah, real consistently, at least that, yes. At least that? At least that. And yeah. are you looking to find anybody in Florida to match up with? If you're out in Naples, Florida, and you're listening to this show, or you're around that area, John is always looking for competition. Call me, I'll play. Yeah, what's your number again? <laughs> Two five three three eight one five six zero oh, eight. Notice the notice you didn't say like only if you're bad or only if you're good. You want to play against the best. Yeah, yeah, of course. Why? Because they make you better, really. Right, and it, would, yeah. you, would the same be true in business? Absolutely. Who you surround yourself? Of course. Yes. Right. So, who are you playing tennis with these days? Um, the Naples groups are a little bit older gentlemen, you might say. Right. Um, and now I'm starting to meet some younger folks. And younger there, it seems to be, you know, 55, 60. <laughs> um, but, yeah. My wife has a lot more tennis groups than I do and maybe a little bit younger. So it's, it's interesting to say that, too, is because right now you don't have to work. So you got a lot of time. You like to work, but you don't have to work. Would that I, be a true I statement? Guess, I guess you could say that. I don't really feel like that all the time, but, yeah. Well, you want to work. Yeah, I do. I like working. You enjoy what you're doing. Yes. And you don't want to sit around and just play tennis all day. Right. So, <laughs> well, but you do play well, a lot of tennis. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean, if I'm going to play four hours of golf and you're playing how many hours of tennis? Uh, it's just an hour and a half, two hours. Hour and a half, two hours. And you, on this league in Tacoma, you built a lot of relationships there. Yeah. Yeah. We have a good group in Tacoma. And, and you're trying to find that group kind of in Naples, the young guys, yes. the, the doers. And so if you guys are out there and you're looking for a, a tennis partner, somebody to play doubles with, someone that's looking to be super competitive, or if you know about a league that John could join up in, definitely. I'll still play singles too, by the way. You'll play singles? Yes. One at, one at, one and what Now, how do you rate someone's tennis ability? I know in golf it's all about the... Uh, you know, you're under par, your handicap or whatever you are. Obviously, I'm an even, Steven, uh, not. <laughs> Most players will just go off the USTA, and essentially you start at um, really 2-0, but mainly 2-5 is where you start. What does 2-5 it, mean? It's just a level. It's a rating system. So right now I'm a 3.5. Um, in Naples, I'm more of a 4.0. It's just how it is. <laughs> so the higher the rating, the better. Yes. Yes. Yeah, and you're saying Naples, you're a four because the competition is less. Yeah, the, yeah. So you put so when you rate yourself, you ask people what their rating is. A lot of times, yeah. And then you you duke it out. There you go. You were pretty undefeated for quite a while in Tacoma too, weren't you? Um, no, I had some good runs. I I was never undefeated like a whole year, but I I made some good runs. Yeah. Like what would be a good run? Um, USTA league, you know, maybe be twelve and one, ten and one in there. Cool. So going back to like real estate and business and all that, for the people who are like younger and they're like, oh, okay, you know, this guy's already got it. What the hell can he share with me? What, what, you, you, you got hustle and determination. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's obvious, you know, you're one of the most successful people that I know. How would you, what advice would you give to young people who are out there listening to us, watching us on YouTube or whatever they're doing right now? Well, it's just, you know, if you, there's more than one way to skin a cat in real estate. Um, but if you're looking to save time, you know, I, I pretty much learned everything on my own, really, through trial and error, through meeting with people, what's worked, what hasn't. I can just, you know, save people a lot of time. I wish I would have met myself, you know, when I was <laughs> just starting out 24 years old and talking to me. Right. I'd save myself years and hours of time. That's a great, yeah. that's a great uh, transition is to talk about mentorship and to talk about coaching and stuff like that. We both spent hundreds of thousands of dollars on coaching and mistakes and all that jazz. In fact, you and I went to a Craig Proctor seminar in San Francisco, yeah. like when I was first getting rolling on the uh, back to the residential game. Right. Yeah. And a lot of these coaches, the thing about them, like the Mike Ferries, and I don't mind saying this on, on video or anything like that, they haven't done it. Right. My like even, even, even the people, and this is why it's so important that John's here today. And this is really what the whole crux of this podcast is. So when we decided to start rolling out our mentorship program as me coaching about investing, I skipped over the fact that I've sold 3,000 homes. I skipped over the fact that my business partner of 16 years has sold over 5,000 homes. And combined with social media and real estate and determination and consistency, real estate can make you a hell of a living. 
Absolutely. And yes. and if you're young out there, mm-hmm. what 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 should you do? Should you get a coach? Should you get started? Well, I, I think uh, what a lot of people can learn from you and I is not only can you make a lot of money in real estate, but it's what to do with that money after. You know, are you are you spending it on stuff that's not going to make you any money, or are you reinvesting really in yourself and, and buying I, assets that are going to continually pay you? I think that's a great point to make right now because John, when I met him, you weren't doing that. I was not doing that, not not to the degree I should have been. No. Well, you were investing in the stock market. As a yeah, real- as, and a little bit in real estate, but really, you know, I didn't have a clear plan. Right. Like I feel we do now and have for the last several years. And for people who feel like they missed the boat, do you feel like you missed the boat? No, no, I don't feel like I missed the boat. There's opportunity. Always opportunity. Right, we're, and we're always constantly looking for more opportunity to, like that. But if you're if you're young and you're trying to get ahead, definitely. Um, now, are you thinking about getting into the social media scene? Are you gonna Are we gonna get you a profile set up and everything like that? We're, we're probably gonna do that. It looks like. Yeah. Well, that's <laughs> that's the whole point. Um, you know, for having you here is, we want to show you what not. John has forgotten more about real estate than ninety nine percent of people have actually done. And going back to that whole Mike Ferry, Tom Ferry, these comparisons, I hear about these guys who are coaches. That's the reason I got into real estate education online is because I watched a lot of the guys and they're like, they have zero experience. They don't know what the hell they're doing. Mm -hmm. It's easy for me as someone who does it to know that they don't know what they're talking about. Now, if somebody doesn't know that- Then they don't know. Then they don't know. But for me as somebody who actually does it, I'm like, they don't know what the hell they're talking about. Right, you can tell. Same thing with the coaching. Mm -hmm. Like how many, successful real estate coaches can you name that have done it in the last 10 years, 20 years? I, I can't name any really. What about Brian Buffini? Brian Buffini, isn't he a referral only guy? Yeah, write postcards, yeah. never done real estate. I think he did it two years ago or two, for two years in San Diego. 20 years ago maybe. 20 years ago. Yeah. How relevant is he? Re- to me, not very. What about Mike Ferry? I don't think he ever sold real estate. And if he did, it was just for a quick minute. But right. And then he spawned this huge, which arguably is a good business plan. Yeah. Like no, his system got a big following and, and they do work. It's just based on what other successful brokers have done and him interviewing them and sharing that information. But he lacks that experience. Right. From going First on. hand experience. How many times have you been rejected on a list? Oh God, that? a lot. Hundreds? <laughs> Thousands. Thousands of rejections and you still keep fighting. Yeah. Well, you, you just learn from every one of them. Right. So if you embrace the failing. Right. Comes the learn. Have we made tons of mistakes investing? Of course. Yes. We, we were just talking to one of my guys, Tyler. You're like, what's taking this property so long to get done? <laughs> and he's like, yeah, we've had like three contractors through there. Yeah. A bunch of money, but that's beside the point. Yeah. Money. We can, <laughs> we can make that up. So, um, so. You know, that's that's the main thing about, you know, if you guys are listening to us right now and, and you're and you're considering, you know, you're in a real estate career and you're considering like, hey, I want to get ahead in investing. Well, you definitely need to make sure you subscribe to this channel. Give John a five star review. Share this video with a friend, the whole deal like that. But more importantly than that is you need to actually make a decisive plan of action and say, who are you going to have help you? Are you going to have somebody who's never done it, doesn't have the experience to do it or somebody who actually was in the battlefield like and still is in the battlefield. You, you're mm. not still actively listing properties. You're giving those to your agents, but you're actively prospecting through your money, through your resources. And how many properties are you guys selling a month out of, out of your office in Tacoma? Uh, probably about 45 a month, right around there. 45, you're one of the boutique offices in town, meaning you're not a name brand, but you're probably the most competitive. Yeah, we like to think so. I mean, we're going to, if there's an expired or canceled, uh, we're going to be on it in some way, shape or form or for sale by owner. So what do you think about this whole social media thing? You were here when I first started my journey. I was, I was not on social media. Both of us were not on social media at all. Like uh, I was not on as of March. You, I don't think I've ever had a profile. March 21, right? Yeah. March of 21 is when I went all in. Yeah. And you kind of watched my journey. Yes. It's been impressive. (laughs) Very. Well, I, I appreciate you saying that. I think that's a little flattering, but I, to me, just like the same as you, it's like, man, I'm, I'm still not even anywhere where I want to go. But I think the most impressive thing is like how many houses you've sold, which is 5,000. And guys tell you that most guys don't sell 100 houses in a year. Even What's the average agent sells like four houses a year? Something like that. Three and a half or four a year. And how many were you selling on average per year? I mean, well, the most was that 2011 year. And then there was years, you know, I averaged 250 to 300 for years. 
before REO. Consistently. Consistently. I mean, yeah. So if you're looking to sell 250, 300 homes a year, and were you using social media? Were you using ad spend? Were you doing, what were you doing? What was, how were you selling those types of, how, how many, how were you selling 250, 300 homes when you didn't have social media? Um, it was just going after every one of them individually. So do you actually think it's easier now? Um, everything still works, but with the social media, it would make it easier. Yes. Right. Because now you actually have a presence. People have, you have social clout. You have all this, like you're just recording everything that you've already done Mm -hmm. for years and years and years. Yeah. We're just, it's just social proof now. Right. Mm -hmm. And for years and years and years, you've sold hundreds and thousands of properties and you've done that with adapting to change after change after change after change. Yeah. When you first started listing properties, wasn't it Polaroid cameras? It pretty much was. Yeah. There was a real estate book that came out every month when I first started. Every 30 days. Could you imagine that now where everything's instant? So to wait 30 days for the new book to come out. So versus the MLS being instantaneous, when the yeah. house got listed, you had to wait for that book to come out. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And then you're flipping through the catalog? Through, flipping through that catalog. <laughs> Wow. And so how have you been able to stay ahead for so long? Uh, you know, just mindset, perseverance, persistence, consistency is the key. Right. So what other words of wisdom would you drop on? You know, I know that you have young children and they're growing up in this world right now. You know, what are your fears for people out there? And what are your um, advice to people who are young and trying to get started and change their lives? I mean, every, everybody is different. So it's just a matter of asking yourself, you know, what success means to you right. and what you're willing to, to uh, put in to get after it. Right. You know? So that's a great question to ask yourself is like, what, what determines your success? Where do you see yourself in the next five years? What, is, what, what does success look for you in the next five years? Um, that's a good question, Troy. Success in the next five years really is uh, probably going to be working more with you and elevating our game plans to whatever we feel. That's awesome. I, I, John, I'm, I'm super stoked about that. I think that like, we always talked about that. If we live together, if we live together, if we live. Yeah, now it's like that actually happens. Right. And and it hasn't been like, we didn't like jump. And I think that's important to talk about, like with partnerships. Have we had disagreements before? Of course. Yeah. Have we ever yelled at each other? Yes. Okay. (laughs) Have you ever been offended by something I've said? Uh, Maybe a little. Yeah. Yeah. And have I been offended by something you said? Probably. Absolutely. And the key thing is that there's always been trust. Yes. And to have a good, and there's always been respect. Mm -hmm. And then somebody, and the way partnerships go wrong is when somebody loses trust or someone loses respect. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to be moving next to each other. And so that goes into that whole like dynamic of keeping the people that are keeping you on top of your game right next to you. Mm -hmm. We always hold each other accountable. We like to side jab each other. (laughs) How's that weight loss going? Yeah. Well, it's just having an open mind and realizing that neither one of us know everything. We always learn from the other person. Right. And I'm super excited for it. Um, I can't tell you what a pleasure it is to have you in here. Are there any other like things that you want to mention to our audience about like, you know, in terms of, you know, tips or secrets or things that held you back early in your career? I think the main thing is, is just the mindset, whether you think you can or can't, you're right. That's right. the main thing. Right. Because if you think you can and you, then you know you can, then you'll do whatever it takes to get whatever you're looking for. Right. And nothing will stop you. Right. Determination. Determination. And once you think, well, I don't know, they're able to do it because of this and that, then you're right too. It's all whatever you're thinking in your head. <laughs> right. So what goes through your head? Uh, d- depends on the day and depends on the year, <laughs> you know, and depends on what goal I'm trying to attain. Right. Um, so. So I think the goal that we have with John joining this whole platform is that we want to help more people who are realtors sell more real estate, number one. And number two is take that income and then invest it into real estate to not only reduce their taxes, but make their net worths go skyrocket high. Yes. Do you think that you would be in the same place if you hadn't invested in real estate 10 years ago? No, no, I would not. No, because like you said, now uh, work is an option and really that is primarily, well, it's almost all because of investing in real estate. Right, 100%, I I agree with you. Like if I hadn't bought that first property, right? Mm -hmm. Made those mistakes. Do we make mistakes on our first properties? Of course. Do we hire the wrong contractors? Absolutely. (laughs) and, And all of that stuff, are we still sitting pretty? Yes.
Right. So guys, if you have any questions, make sure that you comment below. If there's anything you'd like to add, John, this would be the time to do it. Uh, no, I think I'm good. All right, cool. <laughs> well, we, we appreciate having you on the show. He's dropping tons of nuggets. If you guys are in Tacoma, Washington, or if you're in Naples, Florida, and you want to hook up with John, his phone number is 253-381-5608. He will probably, by the time this podcast happens, have a TikTok, have an Instagram, <laughs> and we'll put those socials down here. Make sure you give him a follow. Let's light him up. Give him as much love as possible. He's a near and dear friend to me. He's been nothing but a genuine friend, like in any any capacity. Anytime I'm ever going through something, he always asks about that first and tries to really find out about what I am. He's definitely an excellent salesman in that capacity, <laughs> and he knows how to talk. So I appreciate you guys. Peace. <laughs>